Welcome to our first in-person meeting in a really long time. We're so excited to have you all here. Glad you could join us. If you were part of our meeting in June, we had Luke Comiskey speak on performance, but he mostly focused on basically how to diagnose if you are having a performance-related problem in your workbook. He went through performance recordings, how to do them, what it tells you. But I thought it would be helpful to then go one step beyond that into, okay, so you found some problems. What do you do about them? And so what I'm going to be talking about today are a lot of practical tips for how to improve performance in your dashboards, assuming you are like most of us and things just aren't as speedy as you would really like. Whoops, sorry, that's this one. Too many PowerPoints. Here we go. Okay, so a lot of the tips that I'll be giving today come from this white paper. I highly, highly, highly recommend that you, if you have not already read that, that you do. It's something like 84 pages long. It is loaded with not just tips, but also the whys. So it's not just somebody's opinion as to what might be better. They actually did time tests and did the research and found things that are typical problems and how to correct them. So like I said, a lot of what I'm talking about today is based on that. It goes into a lot more depth and a lot more info. And I'm happy to share that link out with all of you after this meeting. So you don't have to write it down. But please do yourself a favor. Go get that white paper and read it. It's amazing. And I have a few quotes throughout this presentation, and they all come from that paper. So I quoted him, cited him here. Uh, they're, they're all from the author of the white paper. So he says, we can begin to lose our audience before they even begin to experience our dashboard. And that negative impression can color the rest of the experience, no matter how well thought out. You've probably experienced that yourself, if not with your own work, with a coworkers or something you've experienced out in the wild, maybe just a website that will not load. I do give up. I've, I've done that. And so as a developer, I don't want that to be what people experience when they are hopefully coming to enjoy and get something useful out of my dashboards. So it's important to set, set off on the right foot on this. So I'm not going to talk too much. Sorry, let's get rid of some of this stuff here, too. I'm not going to talk too much about more of the mechanics of the processing. I feel like the white paper does a good job of that. Luke covered that a bit last time. I will just say that it's, it's complicated and that Tableau is doing a lot of things behind the scenes. And it does a really good job, but it there are some things that it can't overcome if you design poorly or are just pulling in a whole lot of data. And so these are kind of the four main places where processes are happening. Oh, this is going care that. Where processes are happening that can slow things down. So there's the actual querying time, and then it's got to run your calculations and act to actually display what you're trying to show on the screen and lay it out in the way that you laid it out. So there's a lot going on in order to ultimately serve up the visualization or dashboards that you've created. Also, I'm not going to spend, there we go, spend a lot of time going through this diagram. This is also in the white paper. The point I wanted to make here is that if you have published your dashboard up for your audience to consume, as most of us do, whether that's Tableau Public, Tableau Cloud, Tableau Server, you might think it's your data or Tableau or the server or your browser. It's actually all of the above have a role to play in your user ultimately seeing what they're seeing. And so this kind of goes around through the whole process of so the request is made and the layout. So again, I'm not gonna go through all of this. You can, can take a look at it in that white paper. The point is just that there are many opportunities and places where things can get slowed down, bottlenecks can happen. Some of these we have within our control, some we don't, but it is a complex process. And the, the more that you can do as a developer to streamline this, the better, because there are some things that you won't be able to control. <laughs> so I included this picture of this overstuffed suitcase because all of these tips on here are what I like to think of as let's just let's just throw everything in there. And I get that. I get that desire, especially if you're new to Tableau. You just want to experiment and explore. You're going to try this. You're going to build that. And this looks really cool. And I saw this on Tableau Public. Tableau Public. But if you cram too much into it, of course, it's going to be slower. The more things it has to calculate, the more fields it has to process through, the more marks it has to render, and so on, obviously, the slower it's going to be. If you've got a dashboard that's just loaded with everything you can think of, and I absolutely have been guilty of this, that's more and more things that have to process, render, get laid out, and so on. So this would apply to having a bunch of containers on there, all of your worksheets, your filters, just anything that is in that space 
is something the Tableau has got to be processing. And it's not even just what's visible. One thing that surprised me when I was looking into this and, and wanting to build out this presentation for you all was just the, the weight of your workbook itself can have an impact. So maybe you have 10, 12, 15 dashboards all living in the same workbook. That can also slow things down. Maybe you've got a bajillion worksheets that didn't ultimately make it onto your dashboard, but they're still living in your workbook. That can slow things down. And then I think probably the biggest one, the thing that has the most impact on how quickly or slowly things run is just how much data are you trying to process through? And so I'll talk a little bit later about some things that you can do to push some of that data processing earlier, preferably outside of Tableau. But obviously, if you're dealing with millions of records of data, that's going to be slower than if you've got a nice, streamlined, clean data set. So if you want to try to remember all of these tips together, it's really about don't overpack. Don't put in more things than you actually need, because just the more stuff you have, the more it weighs you down. So as I was just saying about data, if you have smaller data, then that's less info that needs to be processed, transmitted. Remember that whole cycle of ultimately ending up visible in front of your user. So if you can, try to use only the data that you need at the grain that's necessary in your worksheets to perform its analysis. Now, one of my clients is the state of Wisconsin. And so I know very well that a lot of you are probably in the same boat I am and other organizations like that. You don't have a lot of control over what your data looks like. You might say, here's what I need to build. And they say, here's this report we already created. It's got the field you need. You can use that. Or it'll be six months and a lot of money to get you something new or a year. And so you get what you get. If you're lucky enough to work for an org where you can do some of that data processing ahead of time, please take advantage of that. If you can streamline your queries, if you can pre-calculate things, the more that you can do that in your data source before you have to bring it into Tableau, then the less work Tableau has to do and the faster things are going to work for you. So here are some other things that can really slow things down. This one, maybe you didn't realize this. This one I, I will definitely say I didn't know as a new Tableau user. I would see other people's work on Tableau Public and they would have these awesome background images and their dashboards would look so polished and really cool and they'd have these, these image files. And so I wanted to start jazzing up my dashboards and I would bring in image files. Well, it turns out that although there is the settings in Tableau to fit and center your image, and it will do that, if your image is much larger than you ultimately need it to be, that's taking up a, quite a bit of computing power for it to shrink that image to the size you told it you needed. If instead you can pre-compress your image, get it the size you need it before you even bring it into Tableau, that's a really easy way that's absolutely under your control that you can lighten up the load of that what Tableau has to do. That would apply for little maybe little images that you use as, as a shape. It definitely applies for something you might do as a background image. So lots of opportunities there to make your shape or your image the size that you ultimately need it. If you look up old advice on performance in Tableau, you will probably see things like use Booleans or use numeric where possible. Strings are really, really slow. And Tableau has put a lot of effort in the last several versions to improve the way that strings function. That's not necessarily true anymore. Their string fields perform really well. In that white paper they talk about, in fact, in some cases, as fast or even faster than a Boolean. So strings are not necessarily bad. But manipulating those strings is still very processing intensive. So if you have to parse out a piece of your string field to maybe pull the pull the state out of the full address list, or you've got to pull somebody's name out of this whole thing that they entered, or you're looking for a couple of keywords in an open-ended text field. All of that kind of stuff is still pretty resource intensive. And if you can do that ahead of time in your data source, and, and then just have a column that says whether this record has that keyword or not, or maybe it says the keyword, then it will be faster for you. Sometimes you can't get away from it. I definitely use these these calculations, I've used regular expressions, thanks to Google, because I don't know how to use regular expressions. And sometimes there's no choice, but if possible, that's one way you can lighten things up. Another one is filtering on really complex calculations. So filters in general can take up some time. I'll talk about that more in a little bit. But also if you've got things where you've got this all complicated logic and maybe you're referring back to the same field over and over and 
if you just build out these really complex things and then try to also filter on it, Tableau has got to process all the parts. It's got to go check all the data to see if your criteria apply. And you can just see how that can add up to the point where you're really slowing down your, your visualization. So if you can break things apart or simplify, one tip, I don't think I should put it on the slide, so I'll say it now, that surprised me is that sometimes if you're referencing a parameter in a calculation, Tableau will not be able to pre-encode that and save that in your extract. It's got to basically recalculate that every time because the parameter could be anything. But if you can split out the parts of your calculation that don't rely on the parameter, it can pre-calculate that. And then it will do the rest of the calculation against the parameter. It's a little abstract, so happy to talk about that more if anyone has questions. But basically, instead of putting everything in one calculation, which I'm also likely to do, if you could keep the parameter piece separate from the non-parameter pieces and then bring them together, you can realize some efficiencies that way. Yeah. Yeah, the parameter piece, sure. Sure, sure. Okay, so talking about data extracts, the first tip is when you can, use an extract. Tableau has put a lot of work into optimizing how they extract the data. They pre-calculate things where possible. And if you don't actually need live transactional data, don't use it. And again, I know some of you don't have total control over the type of data that you do get to use. But if you can say, I want to extract this, do that. You might remember can't remember what version it was. We still have a whole bunch of buttons over there that all say hyper and hyper fast on it. When they revolutionized the way that they do those data extracts to use the hyper, that made things so much even faster. Yes. Yeah. So extracts are great. And then you can also, on, in addition to that, use data source filters. So maybe you got stuck with some data file that some database engineer put together for you, and it's got a lot of things you don't need, and there's nothing you can do about that source data. But you know that you only care about maybe a certain region or a certain time frame or whatever subsets of that data. If you apply a data source filter from within Tableau, then it's going to keep the rest of that data out of your extract. And now your data source is suddenly a lot smaller than it would otherwise have been. So data source filters are great if you know you don't need that extra data. Another thing you can do while creating your extract is hide columns that you don't need. So I don't usually do that until kind of near the end of my development because you know how it goes. You think you, you know what your customer needs, you build things out, then they say, oh, actually, can we look at that? So you may not always know early on in your development which fields you don't need, but by the end of your development and you're about ready to go live with it, you can run that as a hide your unused columns. They'll, they won't save off in your extract. And again, you, you've, you've shrunk the size of data that you need to process. And then when you publish up your dashboard, whether that be to online, oh, sorry, name change, the cloud or server, you can also embed your, your extract in that. You can also package your data with your workbook and it will, will keep that extract with it. So lots of ways to use extracts. And again, I highly recommend doing that if you do not absolutely need the live data. And most of us don't, let's be honest. Okay, now we'll talk a little bit about calculation tips. So I said this earlier, I'll just repeat it again because it is important. If you do have the ability or have somebody in your organization who can help you with this to pre-calculate in the data source, that's great. Maybe you know you're gonna need a reference line or something that, that gives you the overall total for the entire data set. Well, instead of doing a level of detail calculation to go calculate that, if you could put that as a field in your database, then Tableau doesn't have to do that. So things like that can really help as well. A couple of specific tips if you're needing to, to maybe just find a value, you can use an average, like maybe the same value repeats over and over in every row. All of these can return the same amount, but min and or max will both perform more quickly than either average or ATTR attribute. So when you know that it's the same value and you're just trying to get what that number is, use min, use max instead of average. And that's one that just kind of takes a little bit of a mindset shift if you didn't, weren't aware of that, just kind of get yourself as a developer in the habit of doing it. If you need to build out groups, then there are lots of ways you can do that. Hopefully, unless you're 
completely new to Tableau, hopefully some of these look familiar to you. You can use a case statement, you can create a set, you can create a group, you can use if else if logic, and I put them in order here of how quickly they compute. So the case is the fastest of those, then sets, and so on. So if you have the choice of how to create your groups, and as a developer, hopefully you do, try to get in the habit of using case statements instead of using complicated if else if logic. Or if you're just wanting to rename things, you can actually just use the built-in aliases function that Tableau offers. So sometimes the way it comes out in the database is not really user-friendly and you don't want your user to see, maybe it's missing the vowels or something to save space. So you want them to see a prettier label. Instead of making a new group in order to relabel things, you can use the built-in aliases and that performs a lot faster than actually creating a whole new calculation or a whole new group. Although one caveat with those, aliases do not preserve in every place you might want them to. I've definitely experienced it where I have aliased something, and then I try to reference a field that's been aliased in another calculation, and instead of returning the alias, it returns the original value. So it doesn't work perfectly, but it does work great for things like just displaying it on the viz. So when you have that option available to you, that will be faster for you. Couple more things, count distinct, you'll see this in a lot of the literature if you look up Tableau performance. Count distinct is a very expensive calculation. If you don't need a distinct count, count will be faster than a count distinct. Sometimes it's hard to get away from that, just the way your data are structured. So I'm just letting you know that if you do have the choice, count will work better for you. And then this next one seems really subtle. I am not coming from the, a SQL background, so I didn't really understand why this would be different at first, but it turns out that if you use else if, an if else if statement, just removing that little space between the else and the if will process faster than if the space is there. Tab, the way Tableau runs it does it in a, a more performant way. So that is definitely one that for me has just been a mental shift. Oh, if I catch myself writing else if with a space, I just delete it. One kind of wonders why they even offer else if as an option, <laughs> if else if is so fast. And default, yeah. Uh, I don't think I could explain that very clearly. If anyone else can, feel free to, to chime in why it sees oh. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. And then in as an operator was added maybe three versions ago. I can't remember exactly when they released that. And people who normally write code with SQL and other languages were so excited because that's how they had been doing it all along. And apparently in is a lot more performant. So I do have an example of this one. So you might be in the habit of writing the or statement in the bottom, if state is this or state is that or this or that, and you have as many ors as you need, you can do it that way. It will work, but it will be faster if you use the in operator where you only have to reference your field once and then in and then you have your list of values and those could be numeric they can be dates they can be strings what have you and this one i do know why that one's faster because or logic could be something completely unrelated you could say it's this value on this field or it's this completely different value on this completely different field or so you can build out logic that's really unrelated to each other and you're just trying to make this complicated statement. Whereas in Tableau knows, ah, I only have to care about this dimension. State is in this list. And so that's why it runs faster. Okay, this is a long quote. I don't normally do this in presentations, but the entire thing resonated with me. So I wanted to put it up here. I don't know how many of you can relate to this. Many slow dashboards exist because they attempt to give the end user a way to explore a large data set in an ad hoc way by providing detailed views into the raw data with many, many filter options. But without a clearly defined purpose or message, that dashboard ends up trying to do too much and the performance suffers. Have any of you experienced this? Has anybody said, thank you, a few of you? 
Oh, I want to be able to filter by that. And oh, I need to look at this too. And well, I'm not quite sure what my question is yet. So why don't you just, just give me everything? And you know what? Your customer is your customer. Your boss is your boss. You know how much you can push back on that kind of thing. But maybe if they find out that it will perform better, they will waste less time messing around with things. Maybe you can talk them into having a lean, tight, streamlined dashboard. Otherwise, yeah, a lot of dashboards end up like this. You're just trying to do too much, and that's not really the best way to use it. Tableau has released a bunch of features over the last few years, things like ask data, explain data, that let people do more of that exploratory thing. It doesn't have to be your final production dashboard. So, yeah, a good luck to you in, in pushing back on your, to your leadership on that, but we've all been there. Okay, so now let's talk about some things you can do specific to dashboards. I'll admit right now, I absolutely do not follow the first tip. The, the guidance in, in the white paper was try to keep your worksheets low. Yeah, that never happened. I'm pretty sure I have a dashboard with 38 different sheets on it. Yeah, it's slow and I'm trying to get it better, but there's just so many things I need to put on it. But less than five is a pipe dream. I do try to stay under eight. If I can keep it under eight, I feel like I'm doing pretty well. Maybe 10, but if you can, try to keep the number of worksheets. What they recommend instead is back to that idea of a clear, defined thing you're trying to show, break it apart. This dashboard is for this purpose, for this audience, for this question. This dashboard is for this audience, for this purpose, this question. You don't need one dashboard to be all the things for all the people, in theory. Now, in the real world, sometimes you do. But I'm just telling you what is faster, not necessarily what you can actually achieve. Another recommendation is instead of giving them quick filters or user filters where the filter is, sits visibly on the dashboard and they can interact with it, it's much more performant to instead use a viz to be the filter for another viz. So maybe, and I, I'll show you an example of this in just a second, maybe you have a map of the U.S. or whatever territory matters to you, and they can click on something, show something else. That is going to be faster than them going and selecting. It'll be faster Tableau processing-wise and probably faster for your user as well. I don't like scrolling through a really long filter list, and you probably don't either. So that's, a, that's an easy tip, and it's, it's a good one. If you do use an action filter, consider if you can use the exclude all values option, which just means if you click on something and then unclick it, instead of leaving this other view up, it goes away. And so now Tableau is only rendering the one thing. So actually, let's go ahead and, and take a look at this one in Tableau. So I pre-built a couple of views. Mm -hmm. I was not at all worried about making them look nice, so let's not worry about that. But as I was just describing, I have a map of the U.S. looking at profit ratio here, just good old superstore data. And then I built another view that is at the city level. So to set up an action filter, there's a couple ways to go about that. One easy way is just to click on the sheet that you want to be a filter and then click the little filter icon. And now when I click on anything in that view, the other one filters. So that is an action filter. The action of clicking here filters that. So instead of having both of these show right away, the performance tip is if I go into my, oh, take this out of here. There we go. If I go into my actions and edit this one, there is this keep the filtered values, so everything again, or I can do this exclude all values. So if I do that and then trigger it and untrigger it, okay, there we go. So now if I had my dashboard laid out like this, my user comes in. That, that Tableau is only loading this. It doesn't need to load that until they've made a selection. And this is now faster than it loading both things together. This is a really simplistic example. We probably wouldn't notice the time difference, but you can imagine how that could be used when you have more data or more complex visualizations. So that's the action filter with excluding all values. The other tip that's really helpful here is this is a city at the city level. And although Tableau can check against the data and find out which city goes with which state, I can make it easier and faster for Tableau to do that by just bringing in state into my view and then 
not showing it. So now, instead of Tableau having to go check every record, basically, to figure out what's, what city is supposed to go with that, by putting that field that I'm filtering on in the view itself, that's going to be faster. So now, again, you, you won't notice with just this little bit of data, but that's another tip that's that you as a developer can easily have control over and just make that that faster. The next tip was drilling into details. So that's basically what I was just doing. So you can use action filters to do that. So maybe you kind of reveal a piece of the story at a time. I think this can really help, especially executive level users who aren't maybe as data savvy or aren't as into analytics and dashboarding. You kind of guide them through. And maybe you even, what I like to do is things like this. I'll just, in my title, I'll say, click any state to see its data or something like that. And I'll stick it right in the instructions, depending on who my audience is. And then if I had that action filter, they come in, guided to do an action. Maybe there's something else they do here. Maybe now it's at the city level. Maybe they click again and get down to the customer level. If you use those action filters to drill in one piece at a time, Tableau is only having to load one thing at a time. And for your user, they're not sitting and waiting for the whole thing to show up. They're seeing a piece as they need it. So it works on both sides. It works both from the performance speed standpoint, but I think it can also really work for your user and just being a nice guided experience for them. The other thing that you can do as of whatever, four versions ago, is the show hide. Maybe it's not a drill into an obviously sequential story, but maybe there are some things that your user says, I need to have this. And you know, okay, you need it there, but you don't need to see that all the time. Maybe they insist on having a data table or they insist on being able to look at a trend, look back in time, even though most of the time they only care about what's been happening the last week, whatever it might be. One way you could do that and keep your performance higher is to build that view. So let me bring this back out. So we have our view, and then maybe instead of you drilling into it, what you can do is create the show hide button, and then you can make this button look any way you want. So you could have it as words that say trend line here, or it could be a little picture of a trend graph, or whatever you want that to look like. And Tableau won't have to process it unless and until they click on it. So it's there, it's available to your user, it's not having to load for every user for every time they look at the dashboard. It's just kind of tucked away, available when needed, but not taking up processing time or, frankly, real estate unless you need it to do so. so that's another thing that you can do as a designer. All right, back to this. You're like, wow, when she said tips, I did not know she meant 57 of them in 40 minutes. So this isn't exactly speed tipping, but. We got a lot. Okay, getting towards the end though. Okay, <laughs> you're probably wondering why on earth is there a picture of Mars and a rocket and everything on this slide? It's to help you remember it. So if you have seen the movie The Martian or read the book, and you should, they're both great, especially the book. This tip to me is very much like that scene in The Martian where he's got to modify the spaceship to get it as light as possible. And NASA says, here's all this stuff you can get rid of. Throw those seats out, throw this thing out, throw that out. Get rid of all of this stuff, we need to make this lighter. You can do that to your dashboard too. So if there are things in there that Tableau has added that you don't need, check it. If you're not using the device specific thing, which it turns on by default, which drives me crazy, get rid of those phone layouts, turn that off. You don't need that extra bulk in there. If you are like normal people and design your dashboard and play around and move things around instead of building to a perfect spec, I mean, there's probably some of you out there that do that, but I doubt many of us do. There might be some some leftover garbage in there that showed up because Tableau likes to do that. When you create containers, it'll add more in your hierarchy. You might end up with some containers you don't need. Get rid of that stuff too. This is a hard habit for me to break, but if you put in some blanks just to kind of spread things out a little bit to see how it looked and you like the way it looks, those blanks are still something that has to be rendered. So you can actually take those out and use the built-in padding instead, and that will perform faster than the space. Honestly, it's probably minimal. If you love your blanks, I'm not gonna try to take those from you, but it's telling you they do take a little longer to process than just using the actual padding does. And don't forget to purge things out of your workbook too. 
How many of you have built 17 different versions of the chart that finally makes it in? I mean, it might take a few, right? You don't need those 17 versions anymore once you decide on what the final layout is. Maybe save off a copy or something if you maybe someday might come back to it. But don't let that be in your final workbook. Because even if you don't actually publish it up, the size of the workbook itself is still impactful and overall. So the more stuff you can purge and get out of there, the lighter you can make your workbook, your, your spaceship, the better off you'll be. Almost done, I swear. <laughs> Okay, so Table Public has amazing things in there. I, I get so inspired when I go and I look and see all the cool things people make. A lot of those are not practical for a business setting. People build things that have crazy radial charts and they've got 8 million marks and it looks gorgeous. If you've got millions of rows of data that you're trying to process through in a business setting, some of those views just are not practical. So where you can pre-aggregate or aggregate your views so you don't have a million marks you're rendering, the better. So yeah, you kind of have to find that balance between what looks good, what's pretty, what part serves the purpose, and what will run quickly and perform well. Another tip is if you are using an if else if, it will run faster if the results that you expect most often, if you put those first because it will start from the top, it will find all the records that meet that, then it will go on and find the ones that meet the next. And so if you have a pretty good idea that 90% of your data is gonna result in one of, one of your statements, put that one first and then work your way down. That's another one that just takes some effort to get yourself in the habit of, but it can, can save you some performance. Filters are very common if you can do that as a continuous date instead of giving them a million discrete date filter options. Not only will it perform faster, but it will probably help people be a little less insane than having to look through 24 discrete options when they just want to see the last two years. And then if you can give people a way to select in range format instead of listing all possible options. So sometimes it you need to give them the individual values, but sometimes it makes perfect sense from a user standpoint. Think about it as what range do I want to see? Maybe you're talking about people's salaries and they want to see anything from 75,000 to 100,000 a year. Maybe it's house prices. Maybe it's profit ratios between negative 10 and 10, whatever that might be. If you can let them use that continuous range instead of having to with that one value at a time, that will be faster. We all know that there are going to be times when you're going to have to choose. Hey, boss. Hey, client. You've asked for a lot of things. I can either give you everything you've asked for, all these features, or I can make it perform well. With the things that you're asking, we can't do both. Which is more important to you? And you can either have them make that call, or you can in mind what you know they ultimately need from this. Is this something they're going to be pulling up in front of a, a group? Uh, performance might be the most important piece of that. Your boss does not want to sit there awkwardly waiting for your dashboard to load in front of the board, right? So performance may be most important. Or maybe it's a feature. I can't make that call for you, but just know you're going to have to face that if you haven't already as a developer. Some of these things that I showed you today will help, but ultimately it comes down to that balancing act. And then lastly, I just want to talk about a couple of things that will make things faster for you personally, not what your use, end user will ultimately see, but while you are in the zone of developing. One that I think gets overlooked a lot is just make sure you actually have enough, for, enough memory in your system to run Tableau. If you look at the specs that Tableau provides that they say this is what you need to run Tableau, they say you only need two gigabytes of memory, one and a half gigabytes free. Oh, that's no problem. Well, Interworks did some testing. And they ran two tasks, same data, one on a two gigabyte machine, one on eight gigabyte, and it was half the time to load that data on the machine with more memory. So I have the link in here if you wanted to go read that. It's just a brief little blog post, but it actually does make a difference. So it might be a good opportunity for you to ask your boss for an upgrade. Can I please get a bigger machine? Second one is if you're just getting used to your data, and you might be tempted to pull fields out onto the view in order to see what the values are. You can do it that way, but sometimes there's a whole lot of fields and it might take a while to load. 
what you may not realize you can do is use the describe feature. So instead of pulling city out onto the canvas, if I right click or sorry, left click on the down carrot and go all the way to the bottom to describe, it will tell me the values for that field without it actually having to load onto the canvas. So in this case, city is not a great choice because there are way more than can be shown on the screen at a time, but it certainly gives you a sense of what the data look like. So it might say address, and you don't know, does that mean street address? Does that mean full address? Does that mean city? You can just kind of take a quick peek with the describe and be like, oh, that's what that field is. So I do recommend that. Yeah, to look at all the fields at once. Yeah, you could do that too. Yeah, you can do that too if you want to look at everything in one go. I haven't upgraded Tableau yet on my machine because I I don't want to lose my maximize button. I'm happy to talk about that at happy hour. <laughs> I have thoughts. <laughs> okay. Uh, where was I? Oh, uh, pausing auto updates. So if you have a lot of data and you already know what you want your view to end up like, you do not have to let Tableau process and render every single pill you bring in. Maybe you didn't realize this, but what you can do is go up here to this toolbar and there's this little server icon with a little pause button on it. If I hit that and then start developing, actually here, we'll start a new sheet. And it is sheet specific, by the way. I can start developing, like maybe I know I want country and I want my state out here and I want to do this by color. I'm bringing things in, but nothing's happening. Because Tableau, I haven't unpaused the data refresh. It's just getting, I'm getting things lined up the way I want them. And then when I hit that, it'll run. So that's another thing that you can do if you already have a pretty good idea of what you end up with and not just an exploratory mode. All right. Another thing you can do if you are applying those data source filters, and again, as I said at the beginning, I do highly recommend that if you can get rid of a lot of the data that you know you're not going to need. I used to, I'm so embarrassed to admit this, but I used to go all the way out to this data source, and then it would take four minutes for the whole thing to load, and then I'd apply my data source filter. Yeah, it turns out you can do that from here. You can go up into the data up here, go to your data source, and edit data source filters from there. Or you can right click from here, same thing, edit data source filters and do it from there. You don't have to load the whole data source again. So I'm telling you my, my embarrassing story because I don't want you to go through that same thing. It's a lot easier than I used to think it was. <laughs> All right, a couple more. If you know you're going to ultimately want to filter your sheet, why don't you just start there? And then you will already reduce the number of records that Tableau has to bring in. If you don't want to go the full pausing route so you can still see what you're doing, go ahead and start with your filter. If you know you're only looking at one state at a time or you're only looking at one time period, start with the filter and then bring the rest of the stuff out. It will load faster for you and save you some time. And then as a general best practice, I do like to go check my field types when I do get a new data file. Sometimes what is clearly a numeric field will not come in as a number. I don't know why, but I will go ahead and change those if Tableau did not appropriately pick it up. Usually it does, but if for some reason it didn't, like order ID, this does actually have strings in it, but see how it will, will say that it's a, a string. If I wanted to change that, you can just go ahead and change data type and I can turn that into a number if it was categorized inappropriately. And then I can, can work with numbers instead of strings, which are not much faster, but can be helpful. Also, then you can do math with them if they're numbers. And I do believe we're done. Okay, so last couple of things in this version, 2022.1, Pebble added three new things all related to performance. Now the filters perform better. There weren't a lot of details in there about exactly what they did, or at least I found it kind of vague. So maybe it's one of those trust them, they did something. But if you go out to the new features page, it will talk a little bit about those. They also added this whole new optimized performance analysis, which is actually really awesome. When you're publishing up to server or possibly the cloud, there's a new thing that says, hey, do you want to check your performance? And you hit the button, it works for a lot of the things that I just talked about today. And we'll tell you some quick wins you can do, some places where, wow, this is really bad. Can you get some new data? It'll analyze all that for you. That was pretty cool. 
and then they actually enhanced that in the most recent version. They also added view accelerators in server and probably cloud, where for very important views, like that one that your boss is going to present to the board and absolutely does not want it to be slow, you can turn on acceleration for specific views and it boosted it said up to 100 times. I don't know how they know that, but that sounds really great. So that's available too. And I just have a bunch of resources, various things that I use to put this together that I found really helpful. So I'll send this out to you all. There's even a workout Wednesday focused on performance tuning so that if you want to go test your skills, you can do that. And hopefully, all together, these tips will have helped you take your dashboard from being very, very slow to something that's fast, powerful, elegant, and a whole lot better. And that's it. Was on a different. Uh... All right. Okay. I think we're ready to rock and roll. So, um, this talk is um, a researcher and practitioner perspective to our the premise of our book, which is called Functional Aesthetics for Data Visualization. I have the books out here. I We will be having a raffle at the end of the talk for two lucky people. And if people are interested in buying and having uh, you know, half an autograph from one of the authors, uh, feel free to do so as well. Um, so I wanted to start off, you know, obviously with food. Um, and I would say, argue, you know, beautifully arranged food. So imagine that you're at a restaurant and you're served a meal in this beautifully arranged bento box. Um, and if you observe the main dish is, uh, you know, towards the center of the box, and then you have all these side dishes that are supporting the main dish. Um, and the, the framing, the black framing really highlights the, the relative relationship between the food and the importance of it. And all in all, I would argue it's delightful, both in presentation and, and hopefully in taste, um, which we call a functionally aesthetic food presentation. So what do we mean by functional aesthetics? Uh, Bridget and I define this as a concept of combining uh, perception, visual perception, in particular semantics and intent, where they all function together as a whole, creating beauty in meaningful design. And when we think about functional aesthetics, we often just think about, you know, pictographic to perceptual, but um, what we want to bring to the table here is there are additional subsystems, including the semantic layer and the intentionality layer that really play a role in figuring out how do you make something that is not only functional, serving a particular intent or purpose, but is also beautiful, leveraging uh, perception and the semantics of data uh, into the final product. So for my portion of the talk, um, I'll focus on the research perspective where um, I will explore the role of perception in seeing and understanding data, how semantics plays a role in visual analysis, and how do we de uh, design visual interfaces that understand user intent, and what does this mean to bring it all together? And Bridget will take these ideas and explain how to bring this into actual practice. So the way we've designed this talk kind of mirrors how we've um, designed the book. Um, we have four parts. Uh, perception is the first part. And I will go into one of my favorite examples, which I actually brought up at the last uh, tug in Madison. Um, and if somebody you know, is brave enough, uh, would you like to just stand up and say the color and not the word that you see on the screen? Anybody wanting to volunteer? Yeah, why don't you do that? Red, blue, green, yellow, green, black, blue, red, yellow, black, yellow, blue. Let's go that one. This is, I couldn't do that. But there's green, red, orange. Great. Almost, almost, almost. Last one. You were, you were really good at the beginning. And yeah. So, why is this really challenging? Um, 
And, and the reason is your brain is really is processing uh, the words and you're trying to read the words faster than the colors that are actually used to display the words. And it, and it gets really, you know, exasperating because the, the word and the color representing the word are not resonant with each other. So your, your brain is really messing up how you're actually um, looking and trying to understand this information that's presented to you. And this is what is called the Stroop effect. Um, and this plays a role um, throughout the book. Uh, Bridget will bring up an, an example later on in her talk where she will talk about um, these choices and how they play a role in cohesion when you're designing functionally aesthetic dashboards. So the Stroop effect um, particularly has um, some important takeaways when you're trying to encode data. So when I say that I'm trying to um, create a bar chart um, of my various produce, and if I just you know load it into Tableau, uh, Tableau's default palette will assign blue to broccoli and brown to carrots and so forth. And it's it's a very similar effect that we saw with the color naming exercise. And so if if we were to um, actually design uh, color resonant palettes where green um, is mapped to broccoli, orange to carrots, and so forth, it, I would argue it's a lot easier to understand uh, what is going on in this chart. And so this was a result of a research project that I did with Maureen Stone way back in 2015, where we used Google engrams to understand the most salient color associated with these colorable categorical data, like yellow taxis, for instance. Um, and then we were able to come up with an algorithm to generate these more meaningful color palettes. So continuing on, on the topic of perception and understanding the world around us, our visual environment generally contains more information than we can actually process. And so we're constantly looking for signs so that we can selectively focus on what is important to make sense of the world. And arrows are specialized lines um, that are really effective in terms of depicting path, direction, and relationship between objects. And with COVID and social distancing, you probably saw signage like this, um, where it was kind of the new norm, where businesses place these markers to really get people to queue up appropriately, maintaining proper social distance. Similarly, in illustrations and diagrams, arrows um, play a role in uh, how we interpret these. So in this case, the arrow is pretty effective in us trying to understand how a lever works. You can almost envision the rock being lifted by the lever and, and how much force you need to apply on the other end to actually do that. So as we, as we try to make sense of the world and come up with the right amount of information to do so, um, maps historically have really been the trailblazer in this space where uh, they've inspired the early roots of information visualization to identify what is important in terms of visual communication and how to emphasize that important information and de-emphasize what is less important. Um, and this helps resolve visual clutter and tries to improve information quality. And this is a process called generalization. And these operators um, have been applied to other types of charts. Um, and other types of contexts, including this research project um, that was done last year, where we looked at these generalization operators from the map world, which is a perceptual operator, taking a line chart on the left with all its bells and whistles, including the axes labels and the annotation marks, all the way down to a simplified spark line where only the endpoints are annotated. And I just want to show you a really quick demo. I might show just a part of it in the interest of time. Here, as a slider, the decision size is getting smaller and the chart is generalized. Where less important detail is gradually removed, 
labels are jittered to maximize on legibility and ultimately that the de detailed large size line chart becomes a small spark line. Convert okay. There's like an echo issue, but I just wanted to give you a sense of how this algorithm does stuff in real time, starting from a more detailed line chart all the way to something more simplified. All right. Um, so inspired by generalization for you know single chart types, there's also a movement and a set of principles that figure into retargeting dashboards for different screens, particularly mobile, um, you know, something that came up in the exercise that we did earlier. So here's an example showing adaptive design at work. So a darker background is chosen for this dashboard so it can be easy on the eyes, especially on a mobile screen. And as you uh, see a, a, a dashboard from a design for a desktop display all the way to the mobile, the layout changes into portrait, um, the KPI numbers, which are displayed on a single row and on a larger, wider dashboard are um, modified into two rows. And the map and the bar chart are, you know, continue to be brought closer to one another so that as a user, I can compare these um, marks and values across these two charts easily. And so there's, there's really kind of a principle of figuring out what is important and how to use layout appropriately so that the layout is functionally aesthetic uh, to serve that particular task at that particular context. So as we wrap up this portion of the perception talk, um, I wanted to just present some key, uh, key takeaways. Um, and the first one is representation is context specific and it depends on the task and the underlying data. And it's really important as we think about creating these functionally aesthetic dashboards and charts to emphasize what is important and try to represent the view in the most faithful and recognizable way. And lastly, the level of detail needs to be useful and it needs to outweigh what less important elements are de-emphasized. And that's often the tricky part of this. Um, emphasizing tends to be easier, but how much to de-emphasize and what to de-emphasize really depends on the context and task. So the second part, which is sort of symmetric to what we have in the book, is really understanding how semantics and the meaning of data plays a role in uh, functional aesthetics. And this is a really nice kind of campfire um, image that Bridget put in the book, which really talks about this conversation around a campfire and how do you actually support this meaningful conversation between yourself and the data. And as humans, we, we tend to do this pretty naturally, right? I mean, we, we try to seek out things that are more um, meaningful and then make sense. And this, is, and this really depends on whether we're having a fun dinner with family and friends or at, a wor at work or some quiet time at a library or just, you know, pondering and, and observing nature by yourself. And semantics is a way to really try to ground what meaning is about, uh, because meaning it tends to be rather abstract. And symbols is a very strong example of ways in which meaning is conveyed to people. Um, and, you know, if you look at these symbols, many of these might be familiar to you, right? And they, they tend to be ubiquitous. Um, they serve um, a very pithy pictographic representation of the underlying intent or purpose. So if we bring that into charts, um, I would say that charts are inherently abstract, right? This is a, a Carl Sagan plot of brain and body mass of various animals. And if you're trying to make sense of the chart as is, your eyes are darting between the labels and the arrows and the dots, and you're trying to figure out the pattern. But if we simply replace these labels with icons, all of a sudden, you know, the chart becomes more meaningful to you and you really don't have to do this heavy lifting of figuring out the pattern because the icons represent that information and you could just simply glean the pattern and the relationship, including the goldfish at the bottom and the blue whale on the upper right. 
But semantics is not only useful in the final visualization, but it actually plays a role in the process of converting data all the way to visualization with all these steps that are listed out here. And I'm gonna just talk through a few examples where a little bit of semantics and, and understanding the data goes a really long way in data transformation. So one of my favorite examples of dates, um, it turns out that you know, users in Tableau, you know, we did this experiment where we looked at all these date strings in Tableau, there are, thousands of formats uh, in terms of how dates are formatted. And um, we wanted to come up with an automatic algorithm that can take dates as strings and convert them into dates. But you know, if you look at 1307, the first string, you don't know if it's you know, month followed by date or date followed by month. And so we wrote an algorithm that looks at the, the overall context of the entire data column and so if you look at the second row, you know, 4, 15, 2008, months go only up to 12. So the algorithm knows that it's a month date year format. And um, we, we had an automatic date parser that we implemented on the Tableau research team that ultimately uh, went into the Tableau product. And this is a simple way of looking at the context of the data column to really understand the semantics of what it means so we can do some more intelligent or clever data transformations. Similarly, joins is another really good example. I mean, a lot of times we think about joins where you have an identical column in one table and another identical column in another table, but you could have things like this where you have country code in one table and the actual country in another, and there needs to be a semantic connection between these two columns in order to join them. Um, and so semantics plays a role even for examples like currency. I might have a table in US dollars and another one in Euro, and being able to identify that they're both currency columns and converting one to the other based on the date of the, the data domain. In addition, uh, what I've personally been exploring is the use of semantics to enrich data, which can be used later for natural language interaction, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, so if I take this example of housing data, um, and you look at all these data uh, columns, you know, latitude, longitude, square footage, number of beds, and so forth, and I want to figure out a way in which I could enrich the data and I can support more natural language queries like show me the expensive houses or show me large homes. And if we have um, access to dictionaries and thesaurus or any sort of additional um, you know, information, we can make these inferences where we can take stuff like large houses get the definition and map it to a specific data column and figure out you know what is the what are the bounds of that data that maps to large for instance so this is a pretty hot and upcoming research topic um, where we're looking at different ways we could automatically and semi-automatically enrich data so we can use that for richer interaction later especially through natural language so um, some of the key takeaways uh, from semantics is thinking of ways in which semantics can convey recognizable meaning so that we can make better sense of it, both as someone who is creating or authoring charts, but, al but also for someone who is consuming or reading these charts. Um, NLP and AI techniques particularly have kind of bridged the world of machine language and human language in the context of data analysis. And by balancing that perception and semantics, um, we can support these better and deeper conversations with data through different modalities. So how does semantics and perception really figure into intentionality? Um, and just a little, a small story about this image, uh, which is also in the book, this is an image from it, my vacation in Hawaii, which was this freshwater stream running into a saltwater ocean. And there's a certain intentionality or purpose 
um, you know, for, for the flow and the movement of these two water bodies, which makes a really compelling and beautiful scenic imagery. Um, and so what does that mean when we're talking about intentionality with respect to data? And that is really coming to the core of what analytical intent is. So as a user, when I'm interacting with the dashboard or chart, I might have a particular task in mind, or I might simply want to do some open-ended data exploration. So it's really important um, you know, for the user to be able to interact with an analytical artifact, say a dashboard, by, by being able to pick attributes or you know, pick a quick filter, um, or simply express that intent through natural language. And when we think about language and analytical language and different ways people can express their questions, language can often be vague and its interpretation depends on the context and the inability to precisely define what that means. So on one end, you can have more concrete concepts like tallest, and cheapest, and most expensive. They tend to be superlatives, but it gets fuzzier as you have more of these graded adjectives, like how much is cheap? You know, a cheap house is very different from a cheap bottle of wine, for instance. And then it gets even more abstract when you're thinking about subjectivity, um, especially around you know neighborhoods which is which can get um, you know really contentious or it can also get very personal to that particular person who's interacting with the data so how do we actually reconcile language and its vagueness when we're thinking about designing these systems so a good portion of my research has focused on exploring natural language uh, to understand this analytical intent um, to support questions like this. Um, and earthquakes is a common example that I look at because I'm from California. And so as a user looking at a chart and if they ask a question or type a question, find large earthquakes near California, the way we, uh, we design these systems to address this ambiguity because what does large mean? Large can mean you know, five or more for me, but it could mean eight or more for someone else. And what does near mean? That too is fuzzy. And so we have these widgets that the system uh, surfaces to the user and ask data does something similar as well, where it displays its interpretation back to the user. And as a user, I can modify that, those, those settings and make it more personal or more meaningful to my task. And similarly with language, you can have more pragmatics where you, know, you can ask a follow-up question, like how about near Texas, rather than restating large earthquakes near Texas, right? I mean, when I'm talking to a human and it's like, hey, you know, Jen, do you wanna go and have dinner? And if I say, Jen, for dinner, do you wanna have you know, Mexican or Thai? You're gonna be like, what's going on, <laughs> right? I mean, we don't, we don't restate stuff in context. And so how can we support that sort of pragmatics with systems like this? So in addition to understanding the vagueness in language, um, external knowledge is also really important to kind of enrich the semantics of the data, as I indicated with the housing example earlier. And some of the types of corpuses that we've looked at are like Wolfram Alpha, which has some really nice unit ontologies for unit conversions, um, as well as Wikipedia for temporal types of questions where people will ask questions about you know, temporal events that are going on in their data. So here's just an, a, an example of how these um, external corpuses can really play a role in helping understand a user's intent. So say I ask a question, highest and lowest temperatures in Fahrenheit over fall, and my data is in Celsius, and it doesn't really have um, any sort of data column for fall, um, the system will need to convert Fahrenheit to you know, Celsius and be able to take fall and convert it into the appropriate time range. And looking at the data, it turns out that this is in the Southern hemisphere. So fall is very different in the Southern hemisphere compared to the North, comes up with an example 
and shows widgets to provide an understanding to the user as to what's going on. And as a user, I can have a conversation with the system by playing with these widgets and, and fiddling with the settings and um, the system just understanding that intent with, through that interaction. Okay, this is another video. I hope we don't get an echo this time. <laughs> on my Zoom. Okay. I am trying to find the mute button here. Yeah. Okay. Great. Perfect. All right, that's okay. I think we got it back, right? Yeah. Okay, so what's going on here is this is a COVID dashboard. And as I'm asking a question, I want to know what sort of values I need to look at. And there is a visual auto completion that helps scaffold that conversation that I'm having with the dashboard by showing where the most predominant cases are happening, both by time and location. So there are these visual auto-completion widgets that I can look at and make an informed choice when I'm asking a question. So the, this visual scaffolding is, is kind of a really important aspect of supporting a conversation between the user and the data. And there are different ways of doing so. And I just showed one example. First. So I, I want to just kind of end by saying um, that, you know, in addition to consuming and interacting with data through different forms, including natural language and thinking about semantics and perception and intentionality, um, we're no longer consuming and analyzing data on a traditional BI desktop, right? I mean, we have Slack, Salesforce acquired Slack recently, so we've been thinking a lot about other types of modalities in which people want to ask questions and get uh, data insights. So it's really, uh, you know, medium as a message is really something that's becoming more pertinent, um, as Marshall McLuhan had said. And there are different types of questions that one can ask based on the medium, and there are different ways in which the medium can actually respond to it. And so I just want to sort of end with, you know, a bunch of examples of, you know, other alternative form factors that we're exploring at Tableau Research, including voice chatbots and using metrics, um, coming up with, you know, real-time data interaction on a watch or on a phone, and really rethinking how people converse and interact with their data, and how do these systems understand the intent of the user? and how can we design systems to better support that? So with that, you know, my final takeaways for the intent portion is we need to think about ways in which we can provide affordances for a user to understand, repair, and refine these concepts, especially if they're ambiguous. And as an author, it's important to clarify those back to the user or the reader. We need to provide scaffolds to support intent, and that really depends on the medium. And pragmatics, data, and medium all need to work together to support a cooperative conversation. And with that, I want to hand it over to Bridget, where she's going to talk about how, you know, you can put functional aesthetics to work. Perfect. So let's hope I get this correct and everybody can hear me. So we're going to do the sound check, smile, and seamless transition, hopefully. 
And so a big question about this is just how do we put all this to work? Because it's a lot of information and particularly working with a researcher. One of the coolest things for me is research is proof to me, but then working with video research or putting it into practice was proof to her. So it really is that both sides of the coin. And a lot of times when we think bento box, it's really easy to kind of go into these ideas of frames. And so I know you've probably made them. I know I've made bunches of them. And it's you make these, these kind of layout containers so that way people can easily put things together and organize them. So it's, you know, whether it's I'm making it, maybe I'm deploying some solutions for somebody else to make. And oftentimes when we make these, when you look at this, think about the kinds of charts that you would put into this. You know, when you look at, you know, the very small box at the top, it's a really challenging space to work with if you really think about it. So, you know, do you put a KPI number there? Do you put that like KPI number in a bullet chart? I know for me personally, that is where the donut chart goes. Yes, kids, it is recorded. You heard me. That is where the donut chart goes. And then other times it's, you know, you look at this smaller box. And so maybe I'm putting a line chart there. Maybe I'm putting an area chart there, but I'm putting generally something over time in that space. And then the last two boxes are kind of my main content areas. And so that really large one at the bottom, that might be a great space to put a map. That might be, you know, kind of where my primary content goes. That's going to drive all the action. And that last one ends up being where my details go. That might be a table. It might be some of those detailing charts where you can kind of dig into the information and get more detail. This is kind of one recipe. But when we look at these containers, if we shift the space a little bit, I can't have that same kind of dashboard put there. It just doesn't feel right. The space has changed. And so therefore, the conversation has as well. And so with this, because I've got two items of equal weight next to each other, this might be some kind of pre-post. It might be a digging into here sales and profit. There may be some kind of cause and effect relationship between those two top boxes that I now show. The bottom, it's very unlikely I'll put a map in that because it's a really wide skinny box. You and I both know when we've tried to put maps in these, it requires a lot of creativity. Sometimes you're moving shapes. Sometimes you're kind of rejiggering. Um, hex maps, or you're putting additional charts in there to just make it fit that space. So chances are that kind of focus chart changes pretty drastically, even though the space only changed maybe an inch on my screen. And then that other box also shifted. It shrunk, it became a little bit more narrow. So if I have a table and it's really heavily nested, it's not going to work as well in that space. And so I may opt to do something that's a little bit more detailed, where I focus on one individual and kind of go through that as a dialogue in that way. So just by changing the space, the conversation changes. Moving away from the standard four box layout, if we do something like this, where I've kind of got these, you know, three panels, those three panels, it's not, you know, three top panels and three bottom panels, it's kind of like three primary panels to me. So that top one might be you know, where I put some miniatures of maps on the top. And then below, I've got bar charts, but they all three go together. And chances are very high when I'm reading this, I'm going to go top, down, top, down, top, down, and then move over to those panels on the side. So I've actually changed the reading and exposition order as well. And so space really has a significant impact on how I communicate my message. Very much back to that medium is the message. I've created a space and that changes my conversation. So a big part of what we do in our book is really challenge some of the thinking that we've got out there and to really think more instead of, you know, I've got the aesthetics and I've got function separate, really bringing them together. And so really thinking beyond the borders, looking at, you know, parameters like space as a way of semantically binding our messages together to create cohesion. I love comics for this reason. When you look at comics, they really provide an amazing way to think about spatial reading. And you think about most books you're reading, and it's a very linear message. Occasionally, you get it mixed in with photos but you're reading, then you're looking at the photo, and it is a very linear process. Whereas when you read comic books, you can kind of go through the frame. Sometimes the reading order is not standard. 
So in this example, I've only got one text aspect, but you can kind of read it as, okay, I'm going to do maybe a conventional Z reading on it. But then as you look through it, you might kind of look at, okay, here are the two caps, they're facing off, then the, the water glass. You get the tail responses, you get the big crash, you can kind of see them going off and the end result is that, that cap. And so it kind of plays with how we read and interpret things. And it, it, it's a bit like a movie in that respect. The beauty is we can do this with dashboards as well. And so how we create cohesion, you know, I spent a lot of years, and if you followed me in any way, shape, or form, this will seem familiar. The, the words around the model have changed, but a lot of the items have remained the same. It's that visual grammar. It's the how do we really create and craft our message to our end users? And so the secret to making things sticky, you look at color, and you and I both know color can make or break a good dashboard. When you look at kind of how you sequence them, that's probably one of the harder ones to put together. It's like, where do I put this thing? You know, and we really see, too, the power of sequence with comics because, you know, you change a frame, you move a frame. It can change how you expose that story. Visual supports and style, we recognize this as a branding get a company brand guide and it's like, hey, I need it to kind of fit in this style. It's like, oh, you've got really horrible colors. I talk to a lot of people and it's like, what do you do when the colors are terrible? And I have strategies for that too. When you look at use of space, it also creates that shape. So you think in artwork, we talk about negative space, positive space, white space, um, all of those kind of terminologies that we throw ultimately for how we use space and how we create kind of these macro images. Alignment to me is like poetry. Uh, and how you choose to align things really can change or you know, alter how people receive your message. The final idea is this idea of register. And I promise you there is no cash or transactions involved in this. Um, the only transaction is more of kind of a dialogue. So we'll dig into that as well. So I'll say that color is probably our most familiar concept. It's one of those things, particularly as you get other books, you learn, you know, reduce and remove, start designing in either monochrome or black and white, and you really aim for this very minimalist style when you're doing this. Now, the secret to this is not that, okay, it stays this way. No, 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 no. The secret to this is that this helps us get all the other parameters right. And so when you can get it right in black and white, that tells you that you've gotten all of these other parameters done. So, you know, when you start assessing this, you're looking at things like, okay, I can see that I've got the bar chart. I can see the lines over time. Everything is looking really good. But then I can start seeing the breakdown occur at time of day where I get into hourly temp. What do these lines mean? And then finally, the last, you know, blob of a chart is very, very confusing. So that's where we need to start adding color to clarify. I'm going to go through a couple examples. This is my kind of what I do as a practitioner. I love to do experiments. And so this first one may or may not be how we design. This is the kind of tableau defaults. We go in, we let it choose the standard defaults, that you end up with a lot of blue this way. <laughs> and so you know, as you start designing at the chart level, you say, okay, well, overnight can be blue because, you know, it's blue. Day is bright. I'm going to make it orange. And then evening is red because you get the sunset. And then we've got hourly temperature. Well, you know, we've got this max, which is going to be red because it's hot. And you kind of start assigning different values through all this. And when we get to the final dashboard, it's not very cohesive. There's a lot of semantic overlap. So similar to our Stroop effect, we're really tripping people up because what does blue mean? I know when I was a kid, I would sit and read math books, and most of it went over my head. If you're learning a second language, sometimes you get multiple terms thrown at you, and it's really hard to follow what people are telling you. So then we do this next trick, which is we throw on a bunch of legends. And it's like, hey, here, we've got legends to clarify. Again, very much like reading translated text, sometimes you feel like you're communicating through a wall. And you know that there's something else being said, but you can't try quite follow it. And with this, you end up reading by part by part and not getting the whole picture. 
Or similar to my math example, you're reading the math book, you're going to the glossary. You're reading the math book, going to the glossary, and you're not truly following. So one way to do this when we design in black and white, it gives us time to think through our semantic systems. And so you can see here, this is very aesthetic now. I'm still having a semantic overlap problem. I love that blue, as you can tell. And it doesn't really work. The overnight works, but then that evening kind of obscures into, is it evening? Is it cold? What are you telling me? And so when I redid this a few times, I really ended up into, it had to almost be this greenish color in order to get enough semantic differentiation of this is time, this is temperature. And I had to stay away from the blues with that time of day to really get that nice, clean semantic separation in my color choices. And these are the hidden things that we do. We have the internal conversation with ourselves. And then we realize we're tripping up our end users because they can't necessarily tell what the color clarifies. The other added benefit of it is if you do this and you do it well, and you put in additional scaffolds. So I hover over these items, I get interactivity, I get clarification of, yes, you know, this is time of day, this is temperature. Sequence is perhaps the hardest to get off the bat. When you're doing an analysis, it's really hard to think through, okay, what goes where? Or how am I trying to expose this information? Very similar to writing an essay where, you know, how do you put your points together? How do you walk people through the narrative that you want them to experience? Adam McCann has a really great blog post out there, and he talks about the five types of different dashboards, and he identifies them as a KPI one, a Q&A dashboard, a top-up, a bottom-up, and one big chart. And I love those types of expositions because he really exposes just some of the formulas that are out there for dashboards. And I have more materials later to kind of show you some of this, and a lot more of it is in the book. Um, but as we look at this dashboard, it's really none of the above. And so it's really hard to figure out, you know, the order of it. We do have the interactivity at the map, but, you know, it doesn't necessarily feel grammatical. It doesn't feel very right. And I've got some very small things at the bottom, which we know get neglected. And so one of the things I've done is I've reordered this dashboard. And so now it makes a bit more sense. You can see kind of here's the patterns over time. At the top, they're smaller. And then when you get to the map, you can start interacting. It changes the whole dashboard. And you get a little bit more of that drill down. So it makes a bit more sense. There's also a soft metaphor here. Profit lives over on one side. Everything else lives on this other. So it's almost like two dashboards in one. When I was talking people through the idea of sequence, <clears throat> I kept getting the same questions. Like, well, how do I decide? You know, I make these charts and it's like, what goes where? And I'll let you in on a secret is one of them is quite frequently, the last chart ends up being my detail chart. I actually, oftentimes, the first chart I make ends up on the dashboard in that last spot. So when I did this dashboard, that very large bar chart, ended up being the first one. I spent a lot of time on it. I clarified it. And I was looking at it through these lenses. Well, what about we? You know, what about what types of medication? You know, what's my inventory or what's my use over time? And so it really came about kind of backwards. And we do this a lot. We have an analytical conversation. We make a lot of charts. And so the charts are kind of our experiences with the data. We take out little bits, we pull out themes, we say, okay, we're seeing a pattern here. I'm going to do a couple charts here. And eventually we get to this much bigger picture. And so I call that data orality. And that is where you think about it as a conversation. We're very familiar with orality as a concept. We start talking back and forth. And that exposition style really starts at the granular level and moves up. Now, when you write essays, when you write blog posts, you know that's not the way you do it. You end up saying, okay, here's what I'm going to talk about. Here's some of the themes. And now we get to the details. It's the exact opposite. And so that exposition style mirrors what we see in literacy. It really talks you through kind of this item in a very cohesive fashion. 
The other part is dealing with branding. So this is where you get into visual supports and style. And so you can see here, I have what's called a style tile. This helps me kind of understand where I am from a branding standpoint. This is the system I have to use. And then we organize an architect around it. And so oftentimes we'll use that style tile. <clears throat> Pardon me. And make a frame like this. Now, the one challenge with this is which way do you read? And so my users may struggle a little bit here. Um, you know, it's very nicely contained, but where do they start? Where do they move? Whereas if I frame it a little bit differently and I force them down a given path, they must go down. They will, you know, click on a state, see that the bar chart interacts directly with that state, the KPIs update, everything updates. We, um, and we'll revisit this dashboard. But, you know, I'm also using icons here. I've got the rabbit, I've got the turtle, and I'm really kind of showing people how to navigate this. Um, with you talked about symbols, and I really want to just highlight briefly the symbols used in here are just brilliant. When you've got kind of the splat kind of icon, and it's really showing you how things crash, you're seeing the animals are very well weighted together. So the bird and the other mammals really kind of match each other in weight. Now, what's really cool about this visualization, and it's really hard to see with the data on it, is that the white space is, you know, there's a lot of it and it's very, very well used. And it was a really unconventional visualization at this time. So when you darken it up, you can really see just how much white space is kind of here. And, you know, I also did another version of this in the book where you can see how much text is on it. We do a lot of analysis on, you know, where text is, what kind of text there is. Um, I'm not gonna cover it in this talk, there's just not time. But this gives you an idea of how to kind of use space to create a shape. And, you know, the final part of this, we'll take the same visualization, but we'll look at it through kind of all the alignment paradigms. And to me, alignment is poetry. It's really where you start to direct the eye and play with it a little bit and make all these different ways of, you know, for people to see it without seeing it. You know it when you walk into a house. You can feel when somebody's used the space very well and you feel it. And you feel it here too, because she's got kind of these two main content areas. They're very well used, they're very well architected. But then even at the border, she starts kind of making equal parity. They're, they're balanced, they're very equal. And so the legends kind of all fall in a primary zone. That's by design. And it really, Kelly in particular does this at a level I've never seen anywhere else. Um, and so when I'm making my own, I'm doing a lot of aligning on data ink. And so what I mean by that, you've got the map, that's data ink. I've got the bar chart, you see where it ends. And then with the KPIs, I needed them to go to data ink. So I literally made a background on them just so that they would align on data ink. But then when I move over to the side, I intentionally stopped aligning it on data ink because I want you to go down. And then I want you to go over so I intentionally disrupted that. <laughs> but it's not just the, the charts, it's also the chart types that can affect the space. And so when I made this, a lot of people said, well, it's dual axis. You don't need to synchronize the axis. And I was like, no, 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 I really do. And so, you know, this is why, you know, here's the axis, here's you know, how I've got the items here. If I make it dual axis, I have to put in a legend, I have to clarify, I have to put in the extra colors, and it really makes this huge gap and it no longer follows the paradigm I'm trying to do. So that color or that, that I, the um, <coughs> chart itself really affected my spacing. So when we look at these, these are kind of all the parameters that create cohesion and they're all semantic. And I'm sure you're looking at this going, but wait, you said there was one more. Register is where we really start shifting over into intent. And with register, what we're doing is we're telling people that they can either come into the conversation or keep out of it. We're doing this over video. And the one challenge with it being over video is it makes it more formal. I can't come out into the audience. I can't come and play with you. And I definitely can't monitor your expressions. So this, the register of my presentation 
is actually very different than that of videos because she's physically there. She can respond to you and it's a lot more of a conversation. So even though you're very familiar with me, we are more distant. And that's what register is all about. We can kind of tell people you're invited to the conversation. You're not invited to the conversation. The other part about register is it communicates power dynamics. This is a Tableau user group. We all generally know each other. And so it's really designed to be kind of an equal power distribution. However, we're also coming here as authors. And so that potentially you know, unbalances the power dynamics a little bit. So when we look at register and creating charts, I love this example by Leila Mannheim Lario. She put this together and you know, the bulk of us may recognize this as, okay, this is a Hans Rosling chart redo. But, you know, and we have kind of familiarity potentially with this chart. We definitely have familiarity with the chart type, but we can definitely see where we've got life expectancy versus income per person. And she's done a lot to try to make this accessible to others. You and I both know, though, give a user a status plot, you're going to have certain people struggle to really understand how to make decisions off of it. And I love what she did with this. So this is the deluxe version. And you'll notice that she's put in median lines. She's kind of calling things out. She's got the marginal strip plots to help people see the data differently. Now, when you interact with this, this is where the fun happens. And she starts adding other clarifiers to help you understand, you know, I've selected India and it's, you know, there are 69 countries with lower income. There are, you know, shorter life expectancy in 55 countries. And so she's bringing down the register of this chart that has historically been known to be pretty challenging. And I just, I absolutely love this work. And so Here's my takeaway. So when you look at color, these are kind of your checklist. Start in black and white. Like this is the, really the secret formula. And then when you do put color in, really make sure you know what it's communicating. Um, determine what your narrative style is. And just because it's not in the five that are listed doesn't mean it's wrong. But you may have to at least put words to it. And then toggle the interactivity one chart at a time. I love Tableau because they make it silly simple to turn off and on the interactions. And I, I intentionally go one chart at a time. Is this the one that should interact? Is this the one that should interact? Just because it can interact doesn't mean you want it to. And then, you know, when you're looking at visual supports, make a style tile. That tells you, okay, you know, these zero lines are always this color. My grid lines are always this color. You can copy and paste it, but you're creating the rules in which you abide. And then, you know, frame what works together. Just because you put it a certain way, you can also use those framing aspects to kind of direct people through how they should interact with your dashboard. When you look at use of space, for me, I take my glasses off, and that's the easiest way to see it. For you, you may want to stand back from the computer and really get a sense of this is what it looks like from far away. I can see this one thing is too dark or too colorful because I keep looking at it, and that's the only thing I can see. A lot of times we make headers really hard to see, and you can't actually see the data. So that's one way to kind of test it. And then balance the white space with other aesthetic parameters. Look at you know what your alignment is. Look at your colors. Look at how you sequenced, and play with those to affect that use of space. Alignment to me is where the fun happens. And you want to really kind of pick a very consistent paradigm, whether you're aligning on data ink, whether you're saying, okay, you know, wherever there's text, that's going to be an alignment. Or maybe it's, you know, wherever my zeros are, I'm going to align on my zero lines. You want to be consistent. And when you do break the rules, you want to have a good why. Finally, I mean, you really, and play with it. You really want to have fun. To me, that's where the poetry happens. When you see something, you're just like, wow. Check the alignment. I bet you there is something there. And with the register, what you want to do is you want to continue playing with how do you drop it down. It's called consultative register. You have intimate register, which is where you know friends are talking and I'm keeping you out of the conversation. You have consultative, which is where I'm trying to bring you in and have an actual two-way dialogue. And you do that by adding in those guardrails. Test it and sleep on it. And so if you don't have anybody that you can kind of be your peer with, Go to sleep, check it in the morning. 
So the final part of the book, and I know you've seen this graphic before, um, I wanted to kind of dig into this. And this is where we often start. We start with this pictographic frame of what are charts? Do charts actually have meaning? And I used to make a lot of these way back in my early days where it's like, I don't know, they wanted campaigns, they wanted cities and regions, and they want recommended options. I don't know. Here's your campaign. Here's your city and region. Here's your recommended options. Literally one-to-one match. But it doesn't really answer the question. And so, you know, when you look at this, this is very pictographic, you know, charts, tax, boom, done. And so a part of what we do is we go on this long journey. We get a lot of books and we move to this perceptual stage and we refine, we reduce, we minimize. And, you know, we take it to people and are like, well, where's the flair? Where's the fun? And you're like. So a part of how we get back to that middle ground is by wrapping in semantics. And so we saw semantics at play. We saw things like the Stroop effect. And then what we also do is we wrap our users in intent. So this way we take everybody with us. We support them along the journey. So I wanna revisit that dashboard again. And so you can see it here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna very briefly pick it apart. The tools are in the book, by the way. So don't feel like you know, you're gonna fail this test because we've given you the whole thing in chapter 16. And we identify you know, what each thing is doing, what the context is, and also, you know, how important is it for it to be super precise? And not everything needs to be super precise. It's kind of that hammer we take. It's like, it must be precise. No, no, it doesn't. And so then we revisit it. And we put back in that color and flair, but we make it functional. And so I've got, you know, name sponsorships at the bottom repeated, partly for accessibility. So if you can't see the color, and I don't have my colors all perfectly aligned so where, okay, you know, you may not necessarily notice this. I'm giving people additional supports. It's the same thing I do when I'm driving. You know, I've got the phone out and going, okay, I know I need to make a left turn. Do I need to make the left turn here? I'm providing that wayfinding. And then I'm also providing the additional piece. You click on a thing, it changes color. I'm directing the action. And then I'm also taking that user feedback and saying, okay, well, they didn't think the button stood out enough. Here you go, it's out, it stands out, but it's not as obnoxious and punitive as it could be. The final part that we put in the book, and I'm not gonna go through every single part because there's a 108 point checklist and not everyone will apply. And so you can always say, you know, doesn't apply, doesn't apply. And that way you can start thinking through, here's how to maybe do visualization differently. And this comes from the marriage of research, practice, and theory. This comes from, you know, we these triangles that we've left throughout the book. And so I, this is kind of a chapter breakdown. We've got the perceptual pieces, you've got semantic pieces, and this is kind of where they all come from. And to kind of wrap up, these are all the things we're looking at. I'm not going to list them off or name them, but feel free to kind of take a look and you can kind of see all the different things that we're thinking through in that 108 point checklist. So thank you, everybody. It is on sale now. You are welcome to scan the QR code and hit it off of Amazon or Vidya's got a few copies for some lucky people.